Assalamu alaikum everyone. Welcome to another blessed Juma. Inshallah, we'll just get started right away. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiruhu wa na'uzu billah min shiruri anfusina wa min sayyati amalina. May yahdihillahu falamudillala wa may yudlil falahadiyala. Ashadu an la ilaha illallahu wahdahu la sharika la anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. Ya ayyuhal lazina amanatuku allaha haqqa tukatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. يا أيها الناس أتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا أتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يتي الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما All thanks and praise are due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we seek his help and his forgiveness, and we seek refuge in Allah from the evil within ourselves and the consequences of our evil deeds. And whoever Allah guides will never be led astray, and whoever Allah leads astray will never find guidance. And I bear witness that there is no God but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, alone without any partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a servant and is his messenger. O oh mankind, fear Allah. Fear the words that you speak and speak of appropriate justice. He will amend for you your deeds, forgive you your sins, and whoever obeys Allah and his messenger has certainly attained a great attainment. Amabad. My dear brothers and sisters, today I'd like to continue again talking about the 99 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And today there's three names that uh, are next in the series, Al-Jalil, Al-Karim, and Al-Rakib. But before I do, I wanted to spend a few minutes to kind of remind us you know, what is our purpose? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create us? And we know this from the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created jinn and humans for the purposes of worshiping him. And this is mentioned in the Quran in Surah Dariyat, verse number 56. I did not create jinn and humans except to worship me. And there are many forms of worship. The more obvious form that we know of is salah. You know, we prostrate in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala five times a day to fulfill our purpose and to return our attention to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And with respect to salah, there's an important distinction between us and shaitan. Every time we do something wrong, we choose to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and repent. However, Iblis chose his pride over his obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you recall the story in which uh, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked the angels and shaitan to bow in front of Adam alayhi salam. And every time we stop and pray is an action that we take to show our obedience. And just like a skill, any skill that we learn, you know, we strive to improve our worship and consequently our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, unless we are born with the qualities of Isa alayhi salam, we have to work hard at building that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not just an automatic thing for us. Uh, you know that warm, fuzzy feeling we all get inside when we think about our parents or our spouses or our children or anybody else that we might love. And that is a level of connection that we must work very hard to build with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's not easy. It takes you know, a lifetime for, for probably all of us, if not most of us at least. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us as humans the ability to choose. And we call this free will. We exercise this free will on a daily basis with the choices that we make. The angels, on the other hand, do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands. So for example, the angel Israfil is ordered to wait for Allah's command to blow the horn, marking the day of judgment. Any guesses what Israfil is doing right now? Yep, he's waiting for Allah's command. And this ability of ours to choose is an attribute that we have a share in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from. And this is a theme that I'll come back to again today is that you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the capability and has himself. And we see this in, in some of these, these uh, attributes as we've talked about in the past as well. So the jinn and humans are the ones gifted with free will. And Iblis was from among the jinn. And his status was really high. If you think about it, you know, he's described to be amongst the angels in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in front of Adam alayhi salam. So his status must have been really elevated. And to think that when Allah commanded him to bow in front of Adam, he chose to disobey. He chose to let his pride get in the way of his obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, just like Iblis, 
we too have a choice to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well as not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And like Iblis, we can choose to mock others too who differ from us and let our pride get in the way of our obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to believe in the unseen, to believe and to follow that which Allah has commanded, to believe in the prophets and their message is being Muslim. And a Muslim is one who submits his or her will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how can we build this relationship with Allah? Let's just think about how we build relationship with one another. We start by talking to one another, even little babies. You know, we make those silly faces with babies, but at the end of the day, we're communicating. We try to learn the habits of one another. We try to learn about the things that the other person likes or dislikes. We identify with the other person to see if we have mutual trust and welfare. And if there is an alignment with our ideals, with what we believe in and what we share, yeah, that's how relationships grow over time. The more time we put in, the more it begins to blossom and, and the stronger that relationship becomes. So we can extend that same process to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, Allah's words are given to us in the Quran. The Quran is, without a doubt, the clear proof from Allah and the existence of Allah. And it's not the only proof for the existence of Allah. There are others. However, the Quran is where we go to read the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, as we study the Quran, we learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his likes, his dislikes. The stories in the Quran give us the wisdom from which we can learn about not just ourselves, but also how we relate to the community and the world around us. And through the self-reflection on these stories, you know, we learn about our nature and the way our communities behave. Uh, and then if we're paying attention, we should recognize the richness of the relationship, which goes beyond ourselves. So we should also discover through this learning, through this introspection that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants nothing more than the welfare of each of us in the world and the hereafter. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us more than we give him gratitude for. For example, we're strictly dependent on all the systems created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, whether it's in our uh, you know, immediate surrounding in our, on our planet Earth, to be really scientific there, uh, but also all around us you know, with the different uh, systems, the, the plants, their life cycle, the animals, and so on. And to the contrary, there's nothing we can do that will benefit or harm Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He doesn't need us for his existence. And this is also mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Dariyat. I seek no provision from them, nor do I need them to feed me. And this is in verse 57. Um, here, them is referring to jinn and humans. And angels also worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, unlike the angels, we have a choice to not worship him too. Having free will is one of the tests for us all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every choice we make results in an action. That action is what adds value to our overall deeds and benefits us or takes away value and creates distance between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fact that this morning you got, a bed, you got out of bed this morning, you prayed Salat al-Fajr, that, that was an action based on a choice you made the night before. And the opportunity that Allah has given us is to wake up. And that is something we should be grateful for before we even get to the part of praying Salat al-Fajr. But you chose to fulfill the purpose of your creation by choosing to wake up, get out of bed, and then make wudu. And I know it's really cold right now, so the water is going to be a little bit cold when you first turn that faucet on. And then go ahead and, and submit your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You, know, you could have chosen to stay in bed. You could have focused on staying sleeping. But instead, you chose to wake up for Salat al-Fajr and submit your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for those of us who have faith in Allah or believe in the oneness of Allah and his existence, we will always find ourselves differing with other people of knowledge. And this is also explained to us in the Quran in Surah Al-Jatiya, verse number 17. We also gave them clear commandments regarding their faith, but it was not until knowledge came to them that they differed out of mutual envy. Surely your Lord will judge between them on the day of judgment regarding their differences. Now, here them is referring to the children of Israel who were given the scripture, wisdom, and prophethood before any other people. Yet they debated and sought miracles from Moses before they believed a word that was being communicated. Now, I'm not going to dive a whole lot into that right now because that's a whole other rich conversation that could be had. But this verse, uh, I, I reference because it's also a warning to us Muslims that 
those who claim to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should not twist the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala such that others are misled. And it's very easy. The power of words are tremendous. So much we can do with these words to persuade others into seeing things our way. And that's something that the Quran cautions us through these examples is that, you know, don't twist Allah's words. Don't use it as a weapon against somebody else to shame them or to do other things that would not be of, of benefit to them. And the Quran contains words strung together in a way that is truly a guide and mercy for the people of sure faith. So, I reminder to myself first and then to all of you listening to this that we seek to learn from these names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all of these names come from the Quran. So if we're going to learn these names from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not just knowing them individually, it's also understanding the context in which they're used and how they're actually used. So going back again to the source, the Quran is the best way for all of us. And it's the noblest of all books we have in our world. And studying the Quran is not just a way to increase us in knowledge about our creator, it's also a way to bring us closer to him and these names describe quality that we can try and emulate ourselves in our own lives. Uh, in some cases, not possible. You know, we use metaphors and things like that to understand what the attribute means. Uh, but at the end of the day, Allah has this ability to give to us. And Allah has given to us many, many things. It's up to us to then learn it because we don't have that knowledge right out of the gate. We have to learn and acquire that knowledge and then build on that knowledge and then put that knowledge into practice and action. So let's start today by, by talking about the first attribute, which is Al-Jaleel, the majestic. So the root word for Jaleel is Jim Lam Lam. In classical Arabic, uh, the root word has the connotations of to be glorious, to be sublime, um, to be high, lofty, far above. And majesty refers to the grandeur, the magnificence, the supreme beauty, the regality of something or someone. So for example, we might say the Rocky Mountains are majestic. You know, you look at the photos of the Rocky Mountains, or if you've been to the Rocky Mountains, you know how glorious and wonderful, you know, they look from both afar and when you're near them. And when we say that we are simply talking about the beauty our eyes perceive, you know, the sheer size and scales of the mountains and the presence it projects, uh, you know, that's just talking about visual perception. Now we also refer to kings and queens as majestic. Uh, you know, the queen is her majesty. You know, we refer to that person because of the power that they possess over the people who they rule over, or at least, you know, who, the people who allow them to rule over them. And their majesty is strictly limited to the power that they possess and exert as we perceive it. So when we say something is majestic, we're referring to the qualities that give someone or something magnificence, qualities such as, again, grandeur, knowledge, wealth. Um, the one who is in possession of all of these qualities is supremely and absolutely majestic. So nobody else, nothing other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala possesses that level of grandeur beyond what we are able to perceive. So those with majesty are only in possession of it to the extent that they can be perceived with it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has majesty over all things far beyond anyone can think of. And we can go deeper and say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala possesses the essence of each of these qualities that make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala majestic. So we perceive the essence of Allah's majesty not through sight, but through insight. That is, we perceive it through our intellect. So let me put it a different way. When we see something beautiful with our eyes, we praise it. We praise its beauty as we perceive it with our sight. The very same beauty could be perceived less or more depending on who is seeing it with their eyes and therefore the beauty of that thing is only as magnificent as the one who has the faculty of sight that's requirement number one and perceives that thing as magnificently beautiful as you would and that would be requirement number two so the phrase that comes to mind is beauty is in the eye of the beholder certainly applies here and if one does not possess the gift of sight the beauty of that thing is never perceived and never realized so framing that example to Al-Jalil, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the majestic, Allah's majesty is not dependent on the faculty of sight. As we learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we realize the supreme majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We realize that the external form is limited to our perception of sight. 
to realize the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, truly, we must transfer this perception to our intellectual sight or our insight. When we do so, our perception of Allah's majesty grows with our comprehension of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what better way to do that than to study the Quran and, and, and learn from all of that. And that's how we grow ourselves. And that's how we grow our appreciation for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And nobody other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, has more majesty and honor. There's an authentic hadith recorded by a tirmidhi as narrated by Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. When Allah's messenger said the salam, he would not remain seated except long enough to say, Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam, tabarakta ya zul jalali wa ikram. Allah, you are the one free of defects and perfection is from you. Blessed are you, possessor of majesty and honor. So next time you pray salah, maybe this would be a verse that you would uh, uh, recite also after the salah. So the next name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I'd like to talk about today is al karim the generous. The root word of karim is kaf, ra, mim. And in classical Arabic, the root word has the connotations of to be noble, to be generous, uh, beneficent, valued, to be excellent, and to be productive. And al karim is the one who forgives if he has the power, follows through with his promises and exceeds the expectations one could hope for when he gives. So whoever seeks refuge and support with him is not lost and one may dispense away with mediators and entreaties whenever one is communicating with al karim The one possesses all these qualities with sincerity and without posturing is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala al karim now, as people, we strive to be generous. In fact, it's a quality we care a lot about. Uh, you know, for example, um, when it comes to Ramadan time, you know, we, we care about being generous during those times. You know, we care about giving more than we normally would throughout the year. We, we try not to have that recognition even sometimes, especially if you go to the mosque and there's a fundraiser going on or any venue where there's a fundraiser going on. You know, we, some of us like to keep it keep our names out of the announcements. Others like to have their name announced, but there's no right or wrong one way or the other. But as long as we're doing that kind of generous, generosity with sincerity, that's kind of the, the, the message that Allah wants us uh, to receive, which is you know, step up for others. When you give from, from what you have, that is being grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But some of us might not do that. So especially true in the time of the Quraysh when you know, there was an opportunity to free a slave. So-and-so had a lot of money. Freeing the slave was actually an act of um, status. You know, they wanted to express themselves as somebody with wealth, with the ability to free somebody and that they have the ability to release somebody and give them their freedom. Or if they gave something in charity, this was again true in the time of the Quraysh when they would um, just use that as a way to establish their status. And they would compete with one another for the sake of status. But as Muslims, we know that to be generous means to do something for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's exactly the kind of generosity Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is looking to us and, and asking us to do all year round. You know, be that, to have that share in that attribute, you know, we have to give for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nobody else's. You know, it doesn't matter if our neighbors down the road never hear about our generosity or the world doesn't hear about our generosity ever. It's just knowing that, that uh, we've done that and we've done it with honesty, sincerity, and we're choosing to be generous. Because again, this goes back to the free will that we have. You know, are we choosing to do this? Are we waiting for somebody to tell us to do it? And is that the only time that we do this? So that's kind of the thing that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the ability to have, a, to have a share in that. And we can only give away what we have, my dear brothers and sisters. You know, we can't give away from anything we don't have. So what do you do? How can you be generous when you don't have much in the way of, let's say, material possession? And that's where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it even easier for us. You know, you can always make dua for others who are less fortunate than you are. You can also do something as simple as give a smile to a young child who might not be very happy in that time. So there's many ways to pay it forward and, and be that generous person. Uh, person. And, and being generous is, like I said, a way of, of showing gratitude. And we find this also mentioned in the Quran in Surah Al-Naml, verse 40. And whoever is grateful, it is only for their own good. But whoever is ungrateful, surely my Lord is self-sufficient, most generous. 
Last but not least, I'd like to briefly discuss the last attribute I wanted to discuss today, which is al Rakib, the all observer, the one who knows and protects. The root word of Rakib in Arabic is Ra, Kaf, Ba. Uh, and the connotations for these words are to look, to watch, to be vigilant, to keep an eye on. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala observes with a constant and persistent gaze. Now, this gaze is not a cold stare at what is going on. This gaze is with care, compassion for all of his creations and never forgetting the good deeds or the bad deeds. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be fair with all of us on the day of judgment, having an accurate record of each of our actions is necessary. And this constant reminder to us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ever observant, ever watchful, should deter our hearts from swaying away from the path of righteousness. If we work on ourselves and bring our hearts close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we should feel that gaze of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon us. We should feel that hesitation when we're about to do something or say something that would be displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or even just displeasing to the person receiving those words or that action. And this is called taqwa. When we attain the level of awareness that Allah is always watching us, it's having that fear in our hearts that our actions will be judged on their merits. And our share in this attributes is only praiseworthy when our watchfulness is directed to our Lord. So it's not so much what our neighbors are going to think. It's what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala going to think about what you're just about to say, what you're just about to do. And it's always knowing that we are being watched in every situation, guarding ourselves from the whispers of, of uh, Satan, you know, who we know and believe to be an open enemy to all of us, and always reminding one another about being obedient to our Lord, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So my dear respected brothers and sisters, today I, I briefly touched on three of the beautiful names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Al-Jaleel, Al-Kareem and Al-Rakib. And anytime we learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Quran or the seerah of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we are bringing ourselves closer to our creator. By seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we ourselves are working towards elevating uh, ourselves, not just in this world, but also in the hereafter. And let's always remind one another that having free will is a test for all of us. Having sight and hearing is a test for all of us. Using our faculties of mind, sight, and hearing, we can gain knowledge to add to our existing knowledge. You know, one of the questions we will be asked about on the Day of Judgment is what we did with the knowledge we gain. And we find this in Surah Al-Aqaf, you know, the story of uh, the person who could see the future. And let's remember that this world, like all of Allah's creation, is going to one day come to an end. And we will find ourselves one day in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in front of our creator, being judged for our actions. Inshallah, may Allah always keep us guided by allowing us to emulate these attributes in our lives as we are striving to become better versions of ourselves. I seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for me and for you and to the rest of the Muslims. So ask him for forgiveness. He is the forgiver, the merciful. And let us pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides our hearts towards him. May we all find the strength to stay firm on the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive all of our shortcomings. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is oft forgiving, most merciful. O Allah, when we pray, when we stray, please forgive us. And do not let our hearts deviate after you have guided us. Bless us with pious spouses and offspring who will be the joy of our hearts and make us models for the righteous. And please have mercy upon our parents and the believers on the day of judgment forgiving our sins, absolving us of our misdeeds, and allowing us each to die as one of the virtuous. And please guide the Muslim Ummah closer to you and protect us from those who lead us astray intentionally or intentionally or unintentionally. And please guard our health, the health of those who we love and the health of those who endeavor to provide care and service to the members of our community who are in need. Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa zuriyatina kurrata ayun wa ja'alna lil muttaqina imama ربنا فاغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار ربي جعلني مقيم الصلاة ومن زرياتي ربنا وتقبل دعاء ربنا اغفر لي ولوالدي وللمؤمنين يوم يقوم الحساب ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وحب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوحاب ربنا عليك توكلنا وإليك أنبنا وإليك المصير
ربنا لا تجعلنا فتنة للذين كفروا واغفر لنا ربنا إنك أنت العزيز الحكيم ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنا كننا من الخاسرين إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعزكم لعلكم تذكرون آمين my dear brothers and sisters I wish you all a blessed Jummah and I like to conclude this khutbah as well.